Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Restore Livestream. It's great to be with you today. I was uh, just getting ready for this and thinking it feels like a long time since I've been on the live stream. So I hope that you miss me and uh, I hope you're enjoying. This is Ian with the summer look. Um, so I, I know that uh, we've not had a great run of weather, but I'm expectant that we're now going to have a good uh, summer um, and that the sun is going to shine, which is great because today I'm talking about I am the light of the world. And uh, there's something about sunshine, isn't there, that always makes you feel good. It does me anyway. I, I realise after a uh, long winter that when you get a hot, sunny day, uh, just naturally inside, it, it's like you feel better. And that is the power of light. And we're going to be thinking about that a little bit more today. So just to put this in context, we uh, started a brand new series last week. Uh, Dustin kicked it off on the live stream. Uh, looking at the seven I am sayings from uh, John's Gospel. And uh, that's uh, the way that John chooses to display uh, Jesus uh, or explain Jesus coming and uh, the fullness of who Jesus is, the fullness of his identity. And we're uh, doing this series to follow on the back of the Exodus series that we've just done, which I really love doing. It's a fantastic story. Exodus tells us a lot about uh, the heart of God, the character of God, the nature of God. But obviously one of the pivotal bits of uh, the book of Exodus is in Exodus chapter 3 when uh, Moses has an encounter with a burning bush and God speaks to him out of the bush and uh, calls him to uh, go and uh, lead uh, Israel out of slavery in Egypt and uh, as Moses has this conversation with God one of the things he says is is well who do I say has called me? Uh, when the Israelites maybe question him he, he, he says who can I say has called me and God says to him I am, the I am who I am, the Yahweh name of God. He gives him a fresh revelation, a fuller understanding of who God is. And he says, tell them that Yahweh, that the I am has called you and has sent you and is at work on behalf of you. And Jesus then, when he comes thousands of years later and uh, meets with Israel, uh, when he uh, speaks and teaches them, a number of times he uses the I am phrase. And uh, into a Jewish culture, it would have instantly connected them back to Exodus. That's one of the reasons that religious leaders on the whole freaked out whenever Jesus used the I am statements. Because what he was saying is, God has come in the same way as Egypt was in slavery and felt trapped and in a, in a place of darkness. Then God heard their cries, God heard their prayers and stepped in to make a difference. And uh, at the time of Jesus, again, another time of darkness in the history of the nation of Israel, God steps in the great I am and brings freedom and deliverance. And here we are a couple of thousand years later and in actually very dark, unsettled times. And one of the things we can, confident, we can be confident about is the great I am, the same God, is with us and is stepping in and is wanting to shine his light to us. So last week, uh, Dustin looked at the first of the I am statements from John chapter six, uh, where Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. The second one comes in John chapter eight, and I'll just read a, a verse, one verse um, at the moment. John chapter eight, verse 12 says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's a really great verse, I'll read it again. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, an interesting fact, um, if you read through the whole Bible, you find that uh, God is defined as four things. So God is defined as spirit. In John chapter four, God is spirit. In Hebrews, God is a consuming fire. And in the book of 1 John, it says God is uh, two things. Uh, it says that God is love. Um, and it also says God is light. So four things that God is described as in the uh, New Testament, spirit, consuming fire, love and light. And uh, when Jesus comes, one of the things that he references is he is carrying the light of God. And one of the things we know about light is light causes things to grow. If you're a gardener, I often end up uh, uh, talking about gardening because so many of the biblical illustrations are around gardening, um, even though I'm a rubbish gardener. But one of the things I know it, for plants is that 
light helps plants to grow. And actually, if you put a light, if you put a plant in the darkness, it will shrivel up. So light is one of the essential elements for life. And I think that's why we feel better when we go outside and the sun's shining, because uh, we feel better uh, when we're standing in the light. And right the way through the Bible, there's uh, language about light and uh, light being something that brings help and uh, life and encouragement. Um, so Genesis chapter 1, uh, at the very beginning of all things, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And from that moment on, the creation process starts to happen because the light is causing things to grow. The light is the beginning of life coming. And then you read through the Psalms. The Psalms are great uh, passages of the Bible to read, to find encouragement in different uh, uh, periods of life. But Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 18, verse 28, you, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. And actually, when we flip right through to the end of the Bible, so Psalms are kind of in the middle, we've looked at Genesis, get right the way through to Revelation and the very end of the book of Revelation, so the very last chapter of the whole Bible, Revelation 22, which looks towards the day that we are reunited in the presence of God and uh, the world is renewed into a, a wonderful place and all sadness and uh, tears are wiped away and uh, everything is gloriously restored. It says in Revelation 22, verse 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And so right the way through the Bible, we uh, understand is that God is full of light and he's full of life and his uh, light brings life to us. And so when we connect with God, we also become light carriers. And uh, you can often tell, I, I think, someone who is a passionate follower of Jesus, because it's like they radiate, and it's simply because the light of God is shining within them. So it's not that you've just got the brightness uh, uh, and out of kilter on your TV this morning or on your computer screen. It's simply that I am radiating the glory of God because the light and the life of God is living within me. And it's like a light has been turned on. And if we uh, track this back to the Exodus story, so we see how Jesus in John is the kind of completion, the fulfillment of uh, what happens in Exodus. Um, Pre-Edison uh, and the invention of the light bulb, the way that light was seen and displayed and carried was through fire. So you couldn't uh, switch on your bedside lamp. You would have... Um, a torch that would be lit, that would have fire, and it would be the fire that would illuminate. And so that was the early way of, of carrying and creating light. So when God turns up and uh, in a burning bush, and uh, the bush is, is a flame, that is the presence of God, the light of God, turning up and meeting with Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And so we see the presence of God being demonstrated by light, and that bringing to, to Moses a revelation of who God is. Then in Exodus chapter 13, when God starts to lead Israel on their physical journey out of slavery, it says in Exodus 13 verse 21, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And so we see the presence of God came in a burning bush to give Moses an understanding of who God was. Then for uh, God's people, as they journeyed into their destiny, they were led by the presence of God, this time by a cloud in the day and by fire at night. And uh, maybe we don't get the full impact of this in the UK, um, but given that they were walking through a desert, 
the most helpful thing you could have in the daytime when you walk through a desert is cloud in the sky to provide cover for you. And God led the nation of Israel by providing a covering for them. And one of the things that God promises right the way through the Bible is that he will be a covering and a shelter and a safe place for us. But also in the desert at night with no clouds in the sky, it gets really cold. And so uh, God provided warmth for them and also direction and, and ability to see for when they did need to travel at night by appearing as a pillar of fire. And one of the things we know is that God's presence is here to lead us and guide us. And we see that in the book of Exodus. Then in Exodus chapter 19, uh, Moses goes up Mount Sinai to meet with God. And it says in verse 18, it says, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. And again, we see the light of God coming and uh, uh, manifesting itself in fire and meeting with Moses and uh, meeting with Israel on the top of a mountain. And then in Exodus 27, when they build the tabernacle, and if you remember, the tabernacle was, was like a big tent um, that, uh, that they situated in the middle of Israel. And uh, that had various things within the design of it that would, that would portray, that would demonstrate the fact that God wanted to dwell with his people. And when you went into the holy place, uh, so when the, the priests were the only ones that were allowed to go in there, but when the priests went into the holy place, the first thing that they would see was a lampstand that would be a flame and it would be shining light and would be a reminder, God is light and he's living here with us. In Exodus 27, verse 20, it says, uh, command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning. In the tent of meeting outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant, Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. And Israel were commanded they must always keep this lampstand uh, shining the light uh, as a reminder that God was continually dwelling with them and bringing his light to lead and guide and his presence to be with them. Um, and then you find in Exodus 34, when Moses goes up and meet the mountain the second time and comes down carrying the uh, Ten Commandments with him, uh, what it says in verse 29 is when he came down, his face shone so much so that actually he took a veil to cover it up um, because it frightened the people. But his face shone because he was reflecting the light and the presence of God, or we might say was actually carrying the light and presence of God himself because he'd met with God. In the same way as I said earlier, it, it, people that um, know God well and that are used to dwelling in his uh, presence, it is like they radiate simply because the light of God is reflected in them in the same way that Moses came down and reflected from the mountain. So that's kind of the Exodus uh, uh, examples of where we see light displaying the presence of God. When we come through to John's gospel, John starts it this way. He says in John chapter 1 verse 9, he says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Says of Jesus, calls him the true light that gives light to everyone who was coming into the world. And in John chapter 1 verse 4, says of Jesus, in him was life and the light was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. I love that. In him was life and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Let me tell you, if you have never invited Jesus into your life, if you've never seen the fullness of who God is in Jesus, if you've never understood how much God loves you and wants to live in relationship with you, then you're missing out. And uh, one of the things I discovered is as soon as I invited Jesus into my life and I understood that I was made to live in unity with him, that God wanted to put his love in me, it was like the lights came on for me. It's like before that moment, I was living in black and white and suddenly uh, colour came on. You probably don't remember, a lot of you watching this may be too young for it. But uh, in, in, uh, originally when we first had TV, when I was a, a little boy, it was all in black and white. And then suddenly we went into colour 
TV and everything changed. And that's a bit like what happens when we discover that we were made to live in unity with God. And when we ask God to wash away all the bad stuff we've done, when we ask God to uh, clear our hearts of all the gunk and the rubbish and the stuff that's messed up our life, then we get a new start. But the presence of God in us means that there's just a whole new colour to life. And what John writes in John chapter 1 is that Jesus came to bring that colour And in order that we might know, therefore, life in all its fullness, which uh, Jesus talks about in John chapter 10. So as we carry on then through John's gospel, what we find is John uh, reflects back or has echoes going back to the journey of Exodus and uh, and of God's people back uh, in those times. So in John chapter 6, Uh, Jesus talks about, I'm the bread of life. When they traveled uh, through the uh, desert, uh, God provided manna, daily bread for them. And so Jesus is saying, I've come in order that I might be your daily food. I've come in order that your souls might be nourished in a new way. I've come in order to uh, feed you uh, once more. In John chapter 7 then, Jesus goes to Jerusalem with his disciples for one of the uh, annual feasts. And the feast that's celebrated there is the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, was, uh, was a feast that commemorated how God provided for Israel when they were wandering in the desert. And people literally used to camp outdoors for the time of the feast as a, as a reminder and a thank you and a focus and a reflection on how God had led his people and provided for them in that season. And uh, in the midst of that feast, in John chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus stands up and he says, Let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from him. And so in John chapter 6, Jesus connects to the Israel journey and, and says, I'm the bread of life, I'm the manna being fulfilled now for you. In John chapter 7, he says, I'm the water that you need. And obviously, God supernaturally provided water on the journey through the desert. And that's one of the things that you really, really need uh, when it's hot is the provision of water. And Jesus comes and says, come, drink from me. I'm going to give you the water of heaven. The uh, life of God's spirit is going to flow through me and live in you. So again, it's it's the uh, Exodus language being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And then in John chapter 8, they're still at the Feast of Tabernacles. So they're still celebrating uh, how God provided and led them in the past. And it's in the middle of that that Jesus now makes the statement and says, I am the light of the world. And if you understand anything about the Feast of Tabernacles, you'll know how revolutionary uh, this was and how impactful it was as as, as a statement. Because one of the things they used to do in the Feast of the Tabernacles was light big lampstands, big fiery beacons within the temple. And so in the court of the women, the outer part of the temple, they would set up a four 75 foot high lampstands and they would set them ablaze and keep them ablaze. So every night the temple would be lit up with this fiery flames uh, demonstrating how God used to lead his people in the Old Testament as they were journeying through the uh, wilderness. And then, as you can imagine the context of this, you can imagine Jesus then standing in the temple as you've got these beacons that are on fire. And in the middle of that context, Jesus then stands up and says, I am the light of the world. These beacons are pointing towards the light of God. They're reminding you of how God's led you in the past. But now here I am as the light of the world and I've come to point the way forward for you. It's also really interesting because uh, the very next thing happens in John chapter 9 is there's a guy who was born blind and he comes and meets with Jesus and Jesus restores his sight And uh, often in the Bible, there's a number of uh, stories of blind people who get their sight restored when they see Jesus. But you see, the two events are linked because Jesus has come to give fresh insight, fresh understanding, fresh revelation. So this man has his physical eyes opened, but it's a sign of the fact that Jesus wants to awaken our inner hearts and minds. And actually Jesus ends up in a big argument with the religious people of the day because the religious people of the day are really angry with what Jesus is doing and are really upset that a blind man has got healed. Huh? 
because they'd fallen so far away from how God really wanted them to be, because they'd lost that sense of being united with a God who is love, with a God who is light, and being one with him. But you see, we get a blind man who gets his sight back because Jesus has come to bring us out of darkness into his wonderful light and to to bring us into God's understanding of how life is meant to work and how this world is meant to work. So when I think about Jesus being the light of the world, um, I think it represents for us, it's a reminder really that God's come uh, to do three things in our lives. And uh, all good preachers should have uh, three points that start with the same letter. So uh, as we draw towards the end of this time, in case you're worried, it's going to be a really long one. It's not. Um, three things that I think the light represents when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Number one, it represents the presence of God. Exodus chapter three, when God turns up in a burning bush, It's because God is making his presence known to Moses. And Moses has that revelation moment that he steps out of darkness and discovers God is here. God loves me. God has a calling and a destiny and a purpose for my life. Jesus then comes in John chapter 1, read it earlier, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And Jesus came, God made man, in order that we might know the character and the nature of God. If you want to know what God's like, just read about Jesus, because Jesus is the fullness of God in a man. And so he came to show us what God is like. That's why John says he's the true light that gives light to everyone. So he came to help us understand again how God loves us and wants to be involved in our life. And then in Acts chapter 2, When Jesus has ascended up into heaven and the Holy Spirit is poured down at Pentecost, one of the signs of the outpouring of the Spirit is there there seemed to be tongues of fire, fire representing the light of God and the presence of God, and they separated and came to rest on each one of them. And God wants the light of his presence to be known and received in your life today as much as in my life. There's a story Jesus tells at the end of Matthew's gospel when he's telling his disciples how they need to live in readiness for the fact that he will come back one day. And he tells the story about 10 bridegrooms and uh, they go out to 10 brides, 10 virgins. (laughs) I do know the story, I'll get there. Um, 10 virgins who go to meet the bridegroom And uh, when they go to meet the bridegroom, they have a lamp because he comes in the night. But only five of them have oil to put in their lamp. The other five have a lamp, but no oil. And Jesus says, if you want to live the way I want you to live, you need to keep oil in your lamp. In other words, you need to feed my life in your spirit, in your in your life. And we do that by reading God's word. We do that by worshipping God. We do that, do that by gathering together and singing songs to him. We do that by finding moments in our everyday life where we can just dwell in his presence. Because the God who is light, the Jesus who is the light of the world, wants to put his presence within each and every one of us. So when Jesus says he's the light of the world, what he's saying is God's presence is here for you. Second thing that light represents is purity. Jesus talks about, I'm the light of the world, so I'm going to take you out of darkness. And Jesus wants to remove darkness from our lives. Now, what is dark? Darkness in our lives uh, is the hidden areas, what goes on in the shadows, what we're not prepared to bring out into the light. And the reality is we all have a, a best front that we put on, We'll have our best clothes that we might wear at different points. But behind the scenes, there's the real us. There's the things that go on in our minds, in our hearts, uh, maybe in the hidden parts of life. And quite often, uh, we carry a sense of shame and guilt about that because we know that we're not always living the way that God would have us to live. And uh, Jesus wants us to be people who open up to him those hidden areas and invite him 
to shine his light into them. And one of the things that Jesus loves to do is bring transformation in our lives. That's why this blind man gets his sight back. And it's a sign of the fact that Jesus has come to bring a change in our life. I've been a follower of Jesus now for a lot of years. Um, a lot of years now. Can't work it out in my mind. Um, nearly 40 years, which is a bit frightening. I know I don't look old enough. Um, but I am a very different person now to I was when I was 20 and I first met with Jesus. A very different person because Jesus has set me free from a whole load of stuff. I was carrying a whole load of stuff from my upbringing that wasn't good or that had hurt me or that had damaged me. And Jesus has washed that away and he's brought transformation and he's put his peace and his love and his goodness and his grace within me. And it's made a change. And uh, in Matthew chapter six, Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And the word that's used for healthy there is, is it means without a fold in it. It means um, something that is laid open. So the difference between a, a piece of material with uh, creases in it and a piece of material that's fully unfolded. And what Jesus says is, if you fully unfold your uh, life in front of me, then I will come in and I will wash away the bad stuff and I will put more of my light. You might be watching this this morning and thinking, but I can't open up about that stuff. I feel so guilty about it. I feel so ashamed by it. Um, do you know, God already knows. God already knows the worst stuff in our life and he loves us anyway. So anything that you confess or you say to God isn't a surprise to him. It's not a disappointment to him. He already knows it. He already feels it. What God wants to do, though, is release you from that and put his purity into us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We become one with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And so Jesus comes as light in order to reconnect us to the presence of God. Jesus comes as a refiner's fire to bring God's purity and to remove all the bad stuff from us in order that we can know a restart and become someone who radiates God's presence. And the last thing that light is, it's, it's a pathway into our future. So Jesus, the light of God, is about the presence of God. He's about the purity of God. But he's also a pathway. That's why Jesus talks about whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Jesus calls us onto a journey with us, with, with him. That's why when Jesus speaks to the first disciples, he says, follow me. Discipleship is a lifelong journey, walking day by day with Jesus. And you know, Jesus has a calling. He has gifts he's put within us. He's got a plan for our lives. And Jesus wants to lead us into that. And in the same way, the pillar of fire appeared to Israel every night then God wants to show us that his light to take us forward. I quoted at the very, very beginning, Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, so I don't trip over, and a light on my path, so I can see where I'm heading. I don't know what's going on in your life at the moment. What I do know is that God loves you and he wants to be with you and he wants to lead you into the next season. Maybe this current phase of your journey is tough. Maybe the last season's been very disorientating. Know that Jesus has come to be your light because God has a good future for you. It says that in Jeremiah 29, doesn't it? God has, a, has, has plans to give me a future and a hope. And God wants to give you a future and he wants to give you a hope and he wants to lead you into a good place and the fulfillment of life in all its fullness with him. So a couple of questions to finish and I'm going to pray. But if Jesus comes to bring to us the presence of God in this season, what does God want to show me of himself? If God has come as light to burn away stuff in us that 
is of darkness rather than light. In this season, what do I need God to burn up, to swallow up in my life? Maybe I'm envious, maybe I'm jealous, maybe I am pursuing the wrong things. Maybe I've got other gods that are idols that I'm worshipping. What is it that I need God to remove in this season so I can better reflect and carry his light? And number three, where do I need to hear God's voice in this season so I can better align myself to his calling and his destiny for me? So three questions. What do I need to see about God's presence? What do I need afresh of God's purity? And what do I need God to open up in terms of a pathway for me for the next season? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you have come to reveal the fullness of God to us. Thank you, you are a God of light and a God of love. And I pray for everyone tuning in today that they may know and experience and live in your light and your love. And Lord, I pray, Father, if there's anyone watching this morning that has never really surrendered their life to you, I pray that right now they might experience the presence of God, the light of God, the life of God invading them right now. And I pray in this next season, each and every one of us may have a fresh encounter with you and that our faith in you, our understanding of who you are might grow and increase. At the same time in this season, I pray that we might go deeper in our purity and uh, Lord, I want to be like Moses, that my face really radiates because I'm carrying your light in me. And I know if I'm going to do that, I need to deal with the darkness. And so right now, Lord, I bring any darkness that is left in me. I bring it into the light. I pray that you'll reveal it to me so I can say sorry to you for it, so I can repent of it, so I can let go of it, so I can step into a new place with you. And Lord, I know you have a calling and a destiny for each and every one of us. And I pray right now, Father, maybe some of us have got lost a little bit in our calling. Maybe some of us have been like Israel and we've gone round and round in circles in the desert when actually you wanted to open up a promised land to us. Lord, I pray in this season you will put us back on the right track, heading in the right direction, and you will lead us forward into the fullness of what you have for us. So I pray your blessing over each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. It's been great to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, next week, we're going to be heading on to our next I Am. May God bless you. May you be carriers of the light and the love of God in all you do this week. God bless. <laughs>